thank you. I had a little station break here at my home office. Um, uh, as um, Chelsea has mentioned, my name is Samuel Black. I'm the director of the African American program at the center of John Hines History Center. And before I share my screen, I'll talk a little bit about my uh, background and um, I guess connection and so forth uh, to tonight's topic, uh, Negro League Baseball. Um, thank you. I, um, I started at the History Center 20 years ago. So this is my 20th anniversary uh, as of March of 2022. Um, uh, so I'm really pleased and every day um, I sort of do a personal celebration of uh, recognizing my 20th year there. Uh, but my journey into Negro Leagues actually started in the early 1990s, around 1993, uh, in terms of being a museum professional. And that is when I um, uh, uh, was the uh, associate curator for African-American history at the Western Reserve Historical Society in Cleveland. And around 93 or 94, um, we teamed up with the Cleveland Indians to recognize and celebrate Negro League Baseball. And at the time I put together a small exhibition, um, mostly graphic work, um, very few artifacts, but a small exhibition um, that was focused largely on the Cleveland Buckeyes. The Cleveland Buckeyes was one of the Negro League teams uh, based in Cleveland, used to play out of League Park which was the same um, ball field that the Cleveland Indians um, played out of um, on the east side of Cleveland in a community called Huff. I only lived blocks away from League Park and by the 90s, the field was still there. The stands were gone, but the clubhouse was still there and it was run as a city recreation center called League Park Center. And, um, and at the time we did the exhibition and the Indians had their celebration of the Cleveland Buckeyes. Um, I got into uh, researching Negro League history a lot more and found that there was a real competition in the 1940s between the Cleveland Buckeyes and the Homestead Grays. Now, everyone, whether you knew anything about Negro League Baseball or not, you at least heard of the legend of Satchel Page, Josh Gibson, Cool Papa Bell, and so forth. And um, I sort of became a little enamored with Josh Gibson as I began to learn more and more about him. Um, and the Cleveland Indians had um, uh, like a recognition reception at, at that time called Jacobs Field, the new ballpark in downtown Cleveland. And, um, and at the event, a lot of Negro League players were invited from all over the country. And one of the people who was there was Josh Gibson Jr. And I had a chance to meet Josh Gibson Jr. And he actually signed a photograph of his father uh, for me um, that I don't know where it is now, <laughs> all these years later, wish I still had it. But uh, that was sort of my introduction to uh, Negro League Baseball. And so I followed sort of the Cleveland Buckeyes because after Jackie Robinson was uh, debuted with the Brooklyn Dodgers 75 years ago, um, within a year or two, a couple of the Cleveland Buckeye players were signed to major league baseball teams. One was Sam Jethro and the other one was um, uh, Willie Grace, I believe his name was. Um, and so that began sort of the transition or the integration really of major league baseball, which also sort of signaled the demise of Negro League Baseball. 
so that's where I'm going to begin um, tonight to talk about that and to sort of pick up on um, that history. Okay, the Negro Leagues in Western Pennsylvania um, um, or Western Pennsylvania in baseball. Um, and as I mentioned, um, my introduction to Negro League baseball didn't necessarily start with the Western Pennsylvania teams, but with the Cleveland Buckeye teams. And as I progressed through the years, even before I moved to Pittsburgh in 2002 and assumed my um, role as the director of the African-American program at the Heinz History Center and curated the Negro League Baseball exhibit in the Western Pennsylvania Sports Museum. Um, I, I then began, you know, this journey of wanting to know more and learn more about um, uh, Negro League Baseball. You know, there's one to get sort of the word of mouth to spread through the black community. Um, and then the other to actually do um, historical research uh, to find out more. And a lot of times the legends that you're told aren't really true, or there's a bigger context uh, to everything. And, uh, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about those here. Uh, so as you see on the left in this slide is uh, Composey. And Composey was, um, the a player, player manager, manager and owner of the Homestead Grays, one of the story Negro League baseball teams. I guess if you think off the top of your head, the two teams that probably resonate more with um, people are the Homestead Grays and the Kansas City Monarchs. And, um, and there are reasons for that. Uh, there's no reason why my PowerPoint's not working though. Let me start over. Okay. So baseball in Western Pennsylvania, we're approaching 160 years of baseball in America. Um, people began playing baseball uh, as the sport sort of evolved, um, but uh, was professionalized shortly after the Civil War. Uh, the Cincinnati Red Stockings were the first professional baseball team um, and uh, helped form the Major League Baseball as it progressed through the decade. Uh, decades into the 20th century. But at the same time, African Americans were playing Negro League baseball as well. And um, it was one of the, um, I guess, overlooked aspects of history, but it's specifically baseball history. Um, African Americans, because American society was primarily segregated. Um, there were African-American leagues that were formed. And one of those uh, leagues that was formed in the 1880s had a Pittsburgh team connected to it. And that was the Pittsburgh Keystones. And uh, this was sort of the beginning of baseball in Western Pennsylvania. It sort of had a start, stop, roller coaster sort of ride until um, the 1910s. Uh, in which it was more or less solidified by the presence of the Homestead Grays. But in 1887, the Pittsburgh Keystones were recognized as a pretty good baseball club. And they were one of the first professionalized, organized Negro teams or African-American teams at the time. It was a little different because you didn't really have an organized Negro league. So I'm going to sort of refrain from calling it a Negro League team. Uh, and one of their star players was a future Baseball Hall of Famer named Soul White, who was born uh, King Solomon White. So Soul is short for Solomon. 
Uh, and he played outfield and he played infield, mostly shortstop and second base, uh, but was one of the better ball players in the country, black or white. And um, many um, people and baseball experts recognize that. Uh, this is a guy who played for close to 30 years of uh, organized and professional baseball. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why he was in the Baseball Hall of Fame, because he stayed around long enough to actually play in the Negro National League that was organized in 1920 by Rube Foster in Chicago. But the Homestead Grays was uh, really one of the more consistent, good teams in all of Black baseball. Uh, it was formed initially as sort of a, um, a recreation team out of the steel mills. All the steel mills had baseball teams, they had basketball teams. So they were always in, involved in sports. And a number of steel workers were able to form this team, a uh, homestead that were basically steel workers out of the homestead works there. And, um, uh, and they were formed around 1910. Come Posey, who you see here um, on the second from the uh, left on the uh, screen, uh, Neely, um, is uh, and becomes one of the better um, baseball players amongst the um, uh, sort of semi pro at this time. Uh, Homestead Gray's team. And Posey was also a star athlete in basketball. He played on a team called the Monticello Athletic Club. And I'll talk a little bit about them also. Uh, but the Monticello Club basketball team had a pretty good team around nine, between 1910 and around 1914. And Posey was recognized as one of the best black basketball players in the country. Uh, this gentleman here, who you probably can't see the top of his head, um, third from the left and the second row standing is Smokey Joe Williams. Before Satchel Page, some of the best pitchers were Rube Foster uh, and Smokey Joe Williams. They're both in the Baseball Hall of Fame. And Smokey Joe Williams was um, compared to Major League Baseball pitchers such as Walter Johnson, um, and um, uh, a number of the other um, top pitchers in Major League Baseball. But this was sort of the beginning of the Homestead Grays. So this particular time from 1910 to around 1923, the Grays really solidified their lineup. And at this early stage of Negro League Baseball, players typically stayed with their teams. You're going to see a different type of um, commitment and contracting that will take place after the formation of the Negro National League. So the Grays go on to become a powerhouse throughout their history. Composey moves away from being a center fielder to being a manager, first a player manager, then he was just the manager. So by the early 1920s, when the Negro National League is formed by Rube Foster in 1920, Composey um, uh, declines the offer to join the Negro National League. So the team from Pittsburgh that actually represented um, the city and the Negro National League was the um, reinventing or the, a new iteration of the Pittsburgh Keystones. And the Pittsburgh Keystones um, played out of a field called Central Park that was located in the Hill District of Pittsburgh. It was a small amusement park uh, with a baseball uh, um, diamond there where the Pittsburgh Keystones played their games. Um, and, uh, and they lasted about two years from around 1920 uh, to 1922. Um, as a member of the Negro National League. But Come Posey refused to join Root Foster's Negro National League at that time. And, um, and, you know, he had his reasons. And one is that he just didn't think from a business standpoint, 
it was the best thing for the homestead grays. Remember the grays by this time was really one of the better teams in the country, not just in this region, but in the country. So by the late 1920s, they had solidified their lineup and they began to sign players. Remember I mentioned the contracting. So they began to take players from other teams because basically the contracts were sort of flimsy. Most players were on one year contracts or handshake deals anyway. So Posey was able to go and get some of the better uh, Negro League players around the country uh, and add to his team. And um, one of those was a guy named Oscar Charleston. Uh, and Oscar Charleston played for the Hilldale Giants, which is a team located near Philadelphia. Uh, and was recognized as one of the better outfielders in the game at that time. He is also in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, so by the late 1920s, the Homestead Grays were a real juggernaut uh, and was beating everybody that they came up against. And because they were not affiliated with a league, but was sort of what they call barnstorming at the time, they were able to play both white and black teams. Um, and, um, and play very well uh, and be recognized as really just this outstanding baseball team. Uh, so along comes a new team in Pittsburgh called the Crawfords. And so the picture you're seeing is the city recreation team. The Crawfords were formed in 1926 at the Crawford ba Bathhouse Recreation Center located in the Hill District of Pittsburgh. Um, the director of the center, James Dorsey, who was a veteran Sandlot a amateur athlete, he played Sandlot football and baseball, as well as played basketball in the previous decade, a decade of 1910 uh, to around 1920 or the end of World War I, uh, around 1918 or around 1919. Um, Okay, sorry. Um, and um, as you can see, these are young guys. These are guys who are around teenage years into their early 20s. And one of the people here that you see uh, second from the right sitting on the stairs is your famed Pittsburgh Courier photographer, Charles Teeny Harris. Uh, these guys were not professional baseball players, but they were good enough to win the City Recreation League and, um, uh, you know, was recognized around the city as a really good baseball team. So um, they took notice of one man named Gus Greenlee. Gus Greenlee was the owner of the pits of the um, Crawford Grill uh, nightclub and restaurant located in the Hill District. As well, as well as other business interests uh, that we can talk about at the end of the, end of the program. But um, this is a photograph two years later, 1928 of the Crawfords, which were, at the time they were on the verge of their professionalism. The gentleman, um, the third from the left is Harold Tinker. Tinker was a steel worker and later became a Presbyterian minister. But at the time, he was a pretty good baseball player, but was beyond his years. And he was asked by Tom Posey to take over managing the Homestead Grays. And Tinker, who was not from Homestead, um, really wanted to stay with the Pittsburgh Ball Club. And so he said he would rather play on a team or be with a team that could beat the Grays then joined the Grays. And so Tinker became the manager of the Pittsburgh Crawfords. And this gentleman here, your fifth on the left, is an 18-year-old Josh Gibson. Look how young he looks there. But Josh Gibson, who Tinker felt he would not take over managing the Crawfords unless they can get Josh Gibson on their ball club. Gibson as well worked in steel mills. 
Uh, and many people think he really didn't work in the steel mills. He was a ringer for the steel mill baseball team. He was that good, even at that young age. This is a gentleman next to on, on um, Gibson's right, four from the left is Johnny Moore. And Johnny Moore, Josh Gibson, and Bill Harris would be the three who would later transfer to the professional club once Gus Greenlee became the owner of Pittsburgh Crawfords around 1931. Uh, and this early uh, Crawford teams uh, really became one of the better teams around. They were not only able to compete with the Homestead Grays, but actually began to beat the Homestead Grays. So they began a tug of war in a sense over uh, some of the players. Here you have the Pittsburgh Crawfords, a uh, great baseball team. You see they have their bus there. Not all teams had buses, but Greenlee had cash. And you can see right behind them there is Greenlee Field that was located in the Hill District. Um, it was not the first stadium owned by a Negro League team, but it was the first to install lights. There's a little debate between Pittsburgh and Kansas City with the homes of uh, uh, Kansas City Monarchs in terms of who installed lights first. But it appears most of the baseball historians recognize Pittsburgh Crawfords. Uh, and this is important. It's not just the first to install lights and have night games for Negro League Baseball. It was night games for baseball, period. Major League Baseball games were played during the daytime uh, until their lights were installed uh, shortly after the Crawfords. Um, but as I mentioned before, Greenlee purchased the club in 1931 and began to um, put together a pretty good ball club uh, with the cash he had. Um, he was able to, by four years later, by 1935, have one of the best baseball teams in the country. And most people feel the best baseball team in Western Pennsylvania, including the Pittsburgh Pirates. So I mentioned Oscar Charleston before. There's Oscar Charleston, he's first baseman by this time. He's a lot older, as you can see. This is Sam Bankhead. They brought Bankhead in uh, from a team in Birmingham, Alabama, in which he was the best player there. Here's Hall of Famer Judy Johnson. Uh, Oscar Charleston is also a uh, baseball Hall of Famer. Here's Hall of Famer Judy Johnson a all-star third baseman who came from the Philadelphia Ball Club. Um, and uh, here's Cool Papa Bell. You hear everybody talking about Cool Papa Bell. Muhammad Ali used to talk about he was the fastest Cool Papa Bell. But Papa Bell was known as the fastest person in baseball, black or white ball. Um, and uh, of course, he's a Hall of Famer because of that. And then here's Josh Gibson. The mighty Josh Gibson, he was in his prime around or beginning of his prime around this time. Um, and then here is Satchel Page. Um, so as you can see, there's four Hall of Famers on this team alone. Uh, there's a movement to try to get Sam Bankhead elected to the Hall of Fame as well. Uh, we'll have to wait and see if that happens. But this was one of the better ball clubs in the country. Uh, so Pittsburgh in the 1930s is solidified really as Negro League Baseball, the capital of Negro League Baseball in America, uh, because they had two teams and two of the top teams uh, in the Homestead Grays and the Pittsburgh Crawfords. Um, as well, they had one of the better sports reporting teams in the sports writers and editors at the Pittsburgh Courier that followed these teams. Uh, in, with every single game and really made some of these players household names. So there was a bit of competition, of course, between the Crawfords and the Grays. Competition for the players, because many of them play for both teams. As you can see now, here's a Josh Gibson in the late 1930s playing for the Homestead Grays. And here's former Crawford Satchel Page holding the baseball who's now with the Kansas City Monarchs. Uh, the Crawfords continue to have spring training in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Uh, and uh, the nature of the game had changed so much, as I mentioned before about the contracts. Negro League baseball players like Satchel Page, like Josh Gibson and a number of others, 
um, uh, really uh, tried to play baseball all year round. It was their only livelihood for a lot of these players. So they would play a full Negro League baseball season. And then when the baseball season was over, what we uh, associated with as winter ball, they would go play in um, the Caribbean or in Mexico. As a matter of fact, Josh Kipson one year was the most viable player in the Mexican Baseball League. And he is to this day, the only American baseball player to be inducted in both Major League Baseball and Mexican Baseball and Dominican Baseball Halls of Fame. Uh, so the, many of the players will go and play in either the Dominican Republic or Cuba um, or Mexico um, or Puerto Rico um, and will play winter ball in those particular areas. Uh, they were very well play, paid um, because especially in places like Dominican Republic where you had a dictator, uh, Trujillo, uh, who was the dictator in Dominican Republic and, and owned one of the teams that Josh Gibson played for. And, um, you know, so I guess being the dictator means that your team is going to win anyway, but they had the best baseball player in, from Negro League Baseball playing on their team. Um, and so there was always this sort of um, opportunity for a lot of the Negro League players to make more money playing in, during this winter baseball period than they would make playing in the Negro Leagues during the regular season. Uh, so you can see how uh, Negro League Baseball uh, uh, players really were, were really free agents. Before Major League Baseball, with the Kurt Flood lawsuit and so forth, the free agency was established in Major League Baseball. And some of the players like Andy Messersmith were some of the first people uh, to get million dollar contracts in Major League Baseball, Negro League players were really the first free agents. After each season, they could re-sign with any team that they wanted. So that was a real battle um, to get some of these players like a Central Page and a like uh, a Josh Gibson. So if the Grays and the Monarchs were able to sign those players and have those players for long terms, then they were paid very well and the contracts were friendly to them so that they could go play winter ball and make even more money uh, playing south of the border. Uh, so that was sort of the, the way that major uh, Negro League Baseball had evolved. Now I wanna talk a little bit about um, the demise, if you will, of uh, Negro League Baseball um, in Western Pennsylvania, but also across the country. Um, there's a lot about Jackie Robinson and Branch Rickey who gets a lot of credit, but Branch Rickey didn't come up with the idea of signing a Negro League baseball player. If he did, he probably would not have signed Jackie Robinson. Now, don't say that to slight Jackie Robinson, as we all know from what he did once he was able to play for the Brooklyn Dodgers. He was a great athlete and a great baseball player, but he only played one year in the Negro League. And most people don't recognize that. Uh, Jackie uh, was a graduate of four sports star at UCLA. He played baseball, basketball, football, and ran track. His brother, of course, was uh, Mac Robinson, uh, was a teammate of Jesse Owens in the 1936 Olympics. So uh, it's a family of athletes um, that Jackie came from. And Jackie, um, really didn't like his one year in Negro League Baseball. He played shortstop and second base for the Kansas City Monarchs uh, and occasionally played outfield. He didn't like it because Jackie was just a different person. He was not from the South, like most of the other ball players. He was from California, from Los Angeles. Uh, he was college educated. Uh, he was an army veteran of World War II. Uh, and he was a very strong-willed person who had a lot of self-pride. And, um, uh, and so he was the, the uh, person who played Negro League Baseball because of the discrimination in the NBA and in the NFL at the time. 
Uh, none of those leagues were interested in signing. As a matter of fact, there were no black players in either one, the NBA or the NFL. When Jackie um, graduated from UCLA and came out of the army. Um, and so he had no choice. If he was gonna play a professional sport, Negro League Baseball was the only route he had. So he signed with the Kansas City Monarchs and wasn't sure how long he was gonna remain uh, with the Kansas City Monarchs. The year after his initial uh, year in, in Negro League Baseball, is when Branch Rickey approached him uh, to sign him to a minor league contract for the Brooklyn Dodgers and assigned him to the Montreal Royals in 1945, um, which was the um, minor league team of the Brooklyn Dodgers. Now, the interesting thing to know is that a full eight years before Richie signed Jackie Robinson, a Pittsburgh Courier sports reporter named Wendell Smith who we got to know if you ever saw the movie 42, you learned that Smith um, basically almost lived with Jackie um, during his minor league career in his first year with the Brooklyn Dodgers. He was a sports writer um, with the Pittsburgh Courier newspaper and covered baseball. The Courier hired Smith in 1938 and almost immediately Smith hit the ground running with a campaign to integrate major league baseball. It got to the point where Smith was able to do, Smith as well as some of the other writers like Chester Washington were constantly surveying Major League Baseball players and not just regular players, but the stars in a Major League game about whether they will be willing to play with Black players. And so um, Smith went a step further. Smith began to organize a grassroots uh, effort to protest the color line that Major League Baseball had drawn since the 1880s when Moses Fleetwood Walker was the last player, black player in Major League Baseball. So um, Wendell Smith was able to not only do that, but his campaign um, really was picked up by others. And what I mean by others is the um, uh, organized labor began to look at Major League Baseball uh, and pressuring Major League Baseball with court action that they were violating labor rights um, laws by denying black players the opportunity to quote unquote work as baseball players. Uh, the other was um, um, uh, New York Mayor Le Guardia decided to also bring a lawsuit against Major League Baseball because it was discriminating against New Yorkers who were being denied the opportunity to not only play in Major League Baseball, but also work for Major League Baseball teams. Uh, and this began to grow and grow to the point where there was US Congress was threatening to hold hearings about the discrimination against black ball players in Major League Baseball. So all of this stuff was taking place before Branch Ricky and Ricky kind of was, was monitoring everything and felt that it was coming close. The Major League Baseball really didn't have a legal leg to stand on uh, other than racism uh, was the leg that they were standing on to keep black players out of the game. And so Ricky jumped at the opportunity because he knew that the Pittsburgh Pirates as early as the 1920s had tried out major uh, Negro League players. But the last team to try out players was the Boston Red Sox. And it's ironic that the Boston Red Sox were also the last team to sign a black player. It took until the 1960s before the Red Sox had a black player when they could have had Jackie Robinson or they could have had Josh Gibson or they could have had Ku Papa Bell. They could have had some of these other Negro League stars a long time ago if they had the guts, you know, to go against the grain and sign some of these players. Well, Branch Rickey had those guts. He not only signed Jackie Robinson, within a year and a half, he had signed Roy Campanella and Don Newcomb and Joe Black and the list goes on and on. 
So by 1955, the Brooklyn Dodgers was the best team in baseball. So you can see how all of this sort of progressed. Now, what happened to the two Pittsburgh teams, the Pittsburgh Crawfords and the Homestead Grays? The Crawfords folded around 1938 and their stadium was sold um, and public housing was later built on the land in the Hill District. Uh, the franchise itself was sold to an entity in Toledo, Ohio. Uh, didn't go very well. But by the mid-1940s, Gus Greenlee wanted to uh, reincorporate the Pittsburgh Crawfords and bring the franchise back. The Negro National League and the Negro American League at that time uh, denied uh, Gus Greenlee a franchise. Now, this is kind of important because when the Crawfords were a member of the Negro National League in the early 1930s, one of the things that Gus Greenlee brought to the uh, League of Owners was the idea of having an all-star game. So in 1933, the first Negro League all-star game was played at Comiskey Park in Chicago. It sold out the stadium. That was the first opportunity to see the best Negro League players all playing in one game. And so subsequent years of the Negro League All-Star Game continue to sell out Comiskey Park, where the Chicago White Sox cannot sell out their own stadium. Uh, and this begins a, a, an important trend to understand that the owners of these Major League Baseball stadiums was usually the owner of the baseball franchise. And so Clark Griffith, who owned the Washington Senators, uh, decided to go into a deal with the Homestead Grays. And the deal was that they would allow the Grays or have the Grays play a certain amount of games in Washington, D.C., where you have this larger Black population than existed in Pittsburgh. So the Grays began to sell um, uh, huge numbers of seats at uh, Griffith Stadium in Washington, D.C., as a matter of fact, doing better than the Washington Senators. So it became lucrative for Clark Griffin, Griffith, as well as it became lucrative for the owners of the, of the Pirates in Ford's Field when they had the uh, Homestead Grays play their game. So the Homestead Grays play in Pittsburgh, they're at Ford's Field. When they play in Washington, D.C., they're at Griffith Stadium. So you can see that the Negro League game, it's not like nobody's going to see Negro League baseball games. So Major League couldn't use that. Although the, the commissioner of Major League Baseball, A.B. Happy Chandler, who was a devout racist, he admitted, um, that's what he was, he was, he was living a Confederate life, as he said. Um, uh, his denial of, uh, Negro League teams, because you have to understand, Wendell Smith was not only talking about individual players integrating Major League Baseball, he was talking about franchises as well. So Chandler sort of drew the line from the franchise by saying that Negro League Baseball franchises ownership uh, was not organized, um, was too closely associated with gambling, Wink, wink, Gus Greenlee uh, and others. Gus Greenlee was not the only one. And, um, and that um, they needed to follow the financial rules and guidelines of Major League Baseball before they would be even considered. You know, and that's the sad part of it is because instead of just taking Jackie Robinson, they could have had entire baseball teams uh, integrate Major League Baseball. And if they wanted to, they could have started them out in, at the um, uh, minor league level uh, and let them progress into a Major League franchise. Eventually, that's what happened with the team in Montreal. They became the Expos. Um, and so uh, you begin to see this. So the Crawfords fold in 38. The Grays stay around a little bit longer. As a matter of fact, Josh Gibson Jr. is playing for the Homestead Grays in the 1950s. 
And uh, they last close to 1960, but are somewhere around the late 1950s, the Negro Leagues really gave up because by then they were no longer a real league. There was only a few teams left. They were mostly back to barnstorming again. And they were constantly losing players to major league contracts. Uh, so those teams folded. And there went the history really, at least on the baseball field of Negro League baseball in Pittsburgh. Then you continue to have um, the love of baseball in the African-American communities in Pittsburgh. Uh, but they were now able to cheer for people like uh, Roberto Clemente and Willie Starger, you know, and others of the Pirates and other Major League Baseball teams. Uh, but the legacy remained and Jackie Robinson remained as a figure associated with the Negro Leagues, even if it was just for one year. He's more known as a person who came from the Kansas City Monarchs to integrate Major League Baseball with the Brooklyn Dodgers. And no one really looks at the fact he played one year and his year was sort of a mediocre year. He wasn't a superstar uh, in Negro League Baseball. But aside from that, um, you begin to see some of the other Negro League players, two others um, in particular. One, Hank Aaron, who played for the Birmingham um, uh, baseball team, the same team that Sam Bankhead had played for decades, really. Uh, and you have Willie Mays. And, um, excuse me, Hank Aaron, I believe, played in Memphis. Willie Mays played in Birmingham. And uh, they were both Negro League players and just played for a short time. Willie Mays was, and Hank Aaron were both, uh, you know, you could really say child prodigies. They were like teenagers when they were playing uh, Negro League baseball. And so when they were quickly signed by Major League Baseball because they saw the potential into these young men, and as you know, Hank Aaron and Willie Mays are two of the greatest players who ever stepped on a baseball field. So thank you, and I appreciate you uh, for tuning in and allowing me to talk a little bit about uh, Negro League Baseball in Western Pennsylvania and my love of the game uh, as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sam. We did have a question in the chat and then I'll ask if there's another question or two, but we won't keep you too long. Um, somebody had asked, were the players paid? And if so, who paid them? I know you mentioned in the Dominican they were paid, but what about here in Pittsburgh? Oh yes, they were on contracts. And I, when I mentioned that they were, they were on contracts and usually one year contracts, uh, and then you just renewed for the next year. And it was always negotiation and feelings were hurt and things like that. That's really how Josh Gibson got from the Pittsburgh Crawfords to the Homestead Grays, was that he did not, he just wanted more money than what uh, Gus Greenlee and the Crawfords were offering him. So come Posey says, well, hey, come across the river and we'll pay you this. And so he did. And for a while you have players going back and forth here in Pittsburgh, playing for the Crawfords one year and playing for the Grays next year. And it was all based on getting a better contract. So yes, they were paid contracts. Remember the Crawfords own their own stadium. So they not only played baseball there, they had um, rodeos in, in uh, Greenlee Field. They had musical concerts in Greenlee Field. They had festivals in Greenlee Field. Uh, they had auto racing in Greenlee. So they had income coming in from the use of their stadium to be able to put, so when you see those 1935 guys, four Hall of Famers in front of that bus, uh, they were not there on the cheap. You know, those were four of the best players in the history of the game, Negro League or Major League. And for them to be all on that same team, they were all very well paid um, uh, considering. Um, and of course, Major League Baseball players were paid a lot more. Uh, there's a really good book for anyone who's interested, uh, I did a review of this book for um, Pennsylvania History Magazine. Uh, the Negro Leagues were major leagues. I don't know if you can see that. It's probably backwards on your screen, but um, it's a book by a gentleman named Todd Peterson. And he breaks down the statistics. It was this publication that really uh, provided the statistical evidence, everything from the statistics from playing the game to the contracting, 
to the, um, the gate, the number of people who were playing. So for instance, he talks about the significance of the Homestead Grays playing at Griffith Stadium as a point that if Clark Griffith had owned the Homestead Grays, he would have been in a better financial situation than he was as owner of the Washington Senators. So this was not like high school baseball or a lesser brand of baseball. What was taking place on the field was just as good as Major League Baseball. Um, the difference was access to capital. Like a lot of things when we talk about business at that time between black and white, it was really access to capital. Uh, and the fact that Major League Baseball was a league that was around a lot longer, had government approval and so forth, um, antitrust laws and all these types of things that help protect Major League Baseball and later the NFL uh, and other professional leagues. Uh, those things weren't extended to Negro League Baseball. So, um, so that when you get deeper and deeper into the dynamics of the economics and the financing of the game, you can see that difference. But in terms of the players, they were professional. We mean professional means that you get paid to play. Yeah, that's, it's great they knew their worth too. Good lesson. Um, a few more questions. Um, Greenlee and Posey, Posey uh, mm -hmm. seem to be highly competitive against each other. Did anything drive that beyond the competition on the ball field? Did Posey take umbrage with Greenlee's lifestyle? So that you know, maybe some personal um, tea here. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't have any evidence of that. And I'll tell you why. There was a gentleman named Sonny Man Jackson who became a, the business manager of the Homestead Grays for a short time, but he was more an investor with the Homestead Grays. He had the same lifestyle as Gus Greenlee. So come Posey was not gonna complain about Gus Greenlee num being a numbers runner and being in the rackets and everything when his co-owner uh, was the same thing. And Sonny Man stayed behind the scenes a little bit, but Sonny Man was a great businessman. And a lot of these people are as well as Greenlee was. Greenlee made a lot of money for the Negro National League uh, or Negro League Baseball, put it that way, uh, when he came up with the idea for the All-Star Game. That was a joke of cash into the coffers of these franchises. And, uh, and it was Greenlee's idea to do that. Uh, so when his Crawford's team folded, um, the Negro League uh, owners, and this, this is the interesting thing with Negro Leagues as well, because Wendell Smith argued this all the time, as well as Chester Washington in their columns in the Pittsburgh period, was that for the longest time after Ruth Foster died, Negro League baseball did not have a commissioner. They had an executive committee of owners who made all the decisions. And that was part of the, the complaint that Happy Chandler had against Negro League ownership. But it was an old complaint that was already being made in the black newspapers was that this would be a much better sport. We love what's taking place on the field, but it would be better organized if you had a commission. And it was not sort of this, um, uh, the power broker are the richest franchises that made up the executive council or executive committee. And it was that committee that would not allow Gus Greenlee to buy into uh, Negro League Baseball in the early 1940s uh, with a, a reiteration of the Pittsburgh Crawfords. So what did Greenlee do? He forms the United States Baseball League. And who supports the USBL? Branch Ricky. So you get all these, these things going on. It's not so straightforward. It's a very complex situation once you get into it on the business side. But that's what it is, right? It comes down to business, it seems. Mm -hmm. All right, three more quick questions. We'll be done in a couple minutes. Would Barnstorm Teams games be announced in the Black press? Barnstorming? Yeah. Is that what it is? Okay. Um, yes, they were. Um, when, when the pre 
most of their games before 1920, and I'm talking about the Homestead Grays, were you can consider barnstorming because they were not necessarily a part of a league. I think around 1915, which had been year after the photograph that I had shown, uh, they joined a league called the Eastern League. And that was only for one year. These leagues had difficulty lasting because they just couldn't get the commitments from franchises. And basically it's just like any other business. You buy a franchise, you bring cash to the table. And so a lot of them could not do that each year. Uh, and so you would have um, the Eastern League will come in 1915, it will fold in 1916. Some of the leagues folded in the middle of the season. So Homestead had to make up for those lost games by playing these barnstorming games um, around Western Pennsylvania, Ohio, and so forth. Uh, so occasionally those games were mentioned because they, the teams had a follow -up. So those games were occasionally mentioned in the Pittsburgh Courier. But it's one thing about the Courier is that the Courier in terms of its sports section really didn't take off until the 1920s. And that was interesting because it coincided with the founding of the Negro National League in 1920. And so you had uh, real uh, writers. Uh, Bill Nunn was a sports writer, but he was more or less as an editor of the newspaper, uh, Bill Nunn the first. Um, and, um, but when they brought in Chester Washington in the early 1920s, then I mentioned Wendell Smith around 1937 or 38 or so forth, they brought in these guys who were real journalists and real sports journalists. And they had these sports journalists who were um, experts in one sport or another. Bill Nunn, although he was not officially a sports journalist, but he always wrote in the sports section, uh, covered um, historically black college football. And uh, you had um, uh, W. Rollo Wilson, who covered all yeah. sports, especially boxing. Chester Washington sort of uh, was the person, the journalist uh, who, found, I won't say founded Joe Lewis, but was the first to really promote Joe Lewis. After Joe Lewis only had like six professional fights, he was getting top billing in the Pittsburgh Courier sports yeah. section under Chester, because Chester Washington was the sports editor. And he carried Joe Lewis and promoted Joe Lewis and said he's gonna be a future champ and all this type of stuff. So, um, uh, yes, you know, a little bit of the barnstorming in the papers, but the coverage of baseball really took off when the, when the Grays and the Crawfords were officially professional baseball teams. Well, that's the perfect segue into our last question of the night. Are there any books by the career journalist of the time that you'd recommend? Uh, Wendell Smith wrote a book uh, while Jackie was still playing. Uh, the Jackie Robinson story. Um, uh, I think he wrote another book. Uh, Bill Nunn, that it, Bill Nunn didn't write. Bill Nunn Jr., who became the great scout of the Pittsburgh Steelers. At the same time, he was a scout for the Steelers. He was editor of the Pittsburgh Courier, the New Pittsburgh Courier. And um, how do you uh, but there's spell a Nunn? Bill mm -hmm. Nunn. How do you spell Nunn? N U N N. Okay. Um, Father and son um, covered over 50 years of career history from the 20s through the 70s. And um, um, so Bill Nunn Jr. sort of picked up where his father left off. But uh, there is a great biography of uh, Bill Nunn Jr. written by Andrew Conte. Um, he used to be on TV here, but is now with Point Park University running their media program. Um, and um, Chester Washington, I don't know if he had published a book. Uh, those guys didn't stay in Pittsburgh. Um, Wendell Smith took a job uh, in Chicago with one of the major papers in Chicago. Um, uh, so he left really the black press and Chester Washington moved to Los Angeles and became the editor of the uh, the black paper in Los Angeles, I think it was called the Sentinel. Um, and, uh, and so you begin to see at least around the 1950s, 
uh, the Couriers, you know, I'll call it the all-star team of journalists, began to kind of like sign with, with other newspapers and so forth. Better um, pain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Things were different. Uh, you know, but again, you know, it, it's even complex with how the Courier uh, itself, uh, its own demise in the early 60s. So we'll get that for the next talk. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Sam. And thank you, everyone, for coming for all of the questions. Um, and don't forget to check out our upcoming events. And we'll see you guys soon. Bye-bye. Bye, Cynthia. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Wonderful. Great program. Nice timing. It was perfect. <laughs>